Well, again, it gives me tremendous, tremendous pleasure and a privilege to introduce the, the, next, the next speaker. Um, uh, she's an MD and an architect, and you're my number one MD. <laughs> <laughs> Okay, I, I was lame, I was trying. Uh, Stephanie Taylor uh, did, I think, uh, the nicest job of fundamental research on dealing with moisture, vapor issues, virus transmission, and what's nice about all that, um, she's also an architect, so she understood the issues and limitations, and is looking now, um, I'm going to say, adding uh, into air quality issues to bring them to another level. And um, please welcome Dr. Stephanie Taylor. Well, hello, everyone. Um, and I'm very honored to be here. This is my second time speaking at uh, summer camp. And Joe, thank you. And Betsy, thank you. And thank you for all of your attendance. Um, it was actually very fortuitous. Uh, right before the pandemic, I was preparing a PowerPoint for ASHRAE. So I sent it to ASHRAE, and they meant to send it to Joe's daughter. But it accidentally went to Joe. Unusual last name. So I got an email a couple days later, and Joe said, I don't know you, you don't know me, but I really like your presentation, so will you come speak at summer camp? So I was like, that's <laughs> karma. So um, I'm going to talk with you about something that I think is incredibly exciting, which is um, a platform that I've been working on which actually gives us the ability to scale visualizing, visualizing and managing indoor air quality through the lens of human health. Um, I have half an hour to talk about a lot of things, so I'll try to not just simply talk quickly. Um, and if you have any drastic agreements or disagreements or something you feel that you want to say, just please interrupt me. So I call this indoor uh, health score a building vital signs based on medicine where the vital signs are the minimum number of things you should measure with a patient, blood pressure, temperature, pulse, respiratory rate, and it tells you a vast amount of material about that person's health. So that's how I came up with the vital signs. So. Um, I'm a physician and uh, when it, I'm not really an architect because I'm not licensed, but I have a master's in architecture and I should almost have an honorary engineering degree from talking with all you guys, but I don't. <laughs> um, but you know, I'm really, really busy, but we're all really busy. And uh, that's a good thing, I think. And that's my dog, Luigi, who is behind me. So picking up from last year, <laughs> I started my presentation by showing um, how I really began to get interested as a physician in the role of the indoor environment in human health. I was in Papua New Guinea, this is actually me before my hair turned gray, um, working as a medical student in a very rural hospital. I was there for four months. That was the first time I ever gave anyone an injection and I think we were both terrified. <laughs> It was an amazing experience, and I was stationed in this hospital called the WEWAC General Hospital. And I had come from the Boston Teaching Hospitals, um, and I thought, when I got there, I thought, oh my gosh, this is going to be uh, really sad because, because the, the, what looked like terrible surface hygiene, I was afraid that patients would get new infections from being in the hospital. So that was sort of my backdrop. And last year, and I have to follow up because at least it woke some people up. I was somehow compelled to tell everybody why I was staring at that guy on the operating table. So do you want to know why I was? Okay, so this is like graphic warning time. So I was like, what was I staring at? <laughs> it, it turns out that that gentleman had a uh, a parasitic infection of his inguinal lymph node. So the lymph, lymph nodes in his groin. As a consequence of this infection, the parasite's eggs and dead parasites had clogged up the lymph nodes in his groin. And as a guy, if you're a guy and your lymph nodes are clogged up, your scrotum gets really enlarged. So this poor guy walked into the Wewak General Hospital. Nobody spoke his dialect. He came in, he, he was carrying it 
his scrotum in a sling, and we just sort of assumed that that was a problem. You know? <laughs> yeah, he may have been the chief of his village, and we like totally dethroned him. But anyway, so if you're squeamish about testicles, <laughs> you need to shut your eyes for a split second. And I'm not going to show any interoperative photos, but I will show you. This is, he came in, and this was the gentleman. So HIPAA, you can't see his eyes. So this is pre-op, but his, his surgeon, so that's what it <laughs> Okay, you want me to put that back? There it is. <laughs> so the good news is his testicles were actually okay. It was just his scrotum that was enlarged. And I kind of fell back because he probably hadn't seen his penis for like a long time. But anyway, moving along. Next year, I'll show the, the, the post-op picture. <laughs> but back to the, the serious stuff. So I was in New Guinea. I came back to Boston and continued to work as a medical student and then resident and then resident and resident because I did three residencies. And the, the environment looked very pristine. And yet, a lot of us know that healthcare-associated infections are a huge problem. So as a physician, I began to see sort of patterns um, in the hospital. I thought, the building has something to do with this. I talked to my physician colleagues. They were just like, look, wash your hands, give the right antibiotics, and that's all you can do. I tried talking with the building folks, the facility manager, and I didn't know anything about buildings, and they just began to run the other way when they saw me coming. So eventually, in my 40s, I went back to school and got my master's in architecture and designed hospitals for about 10 years so I could understand buildings. It was quite an experience. But what I have come to realize is that there's this huge disconnect between medicine and managing buildings. You know, unfortunately, I, I have to be honest about it, you know, as a physician, we're in the business of sickness. You know, we're not, prevention is not profitable in the healthcare industry. It's, it's sad, but I think it's very true. And again, each of these topics we could talk for a long time about. But so what I want to talk to you about today is how to unite managing buildings and medical outcomes, or at least seeing indoor air and indoor environments through the lens of human health. Because I know I'm probably biased, but I think that occupant health should be the number one priority in um, our buildings, in occupied buildings. So how do we get, how do we do that? How do we do that in a way that's based on medical data? So how does indoor air quality affect our health? You know, Bill Bansleth talked about ASHRAE 241, which is an incredible uh, accomplishment. And yes, one of the things that affects our health, especially in times of a, of a pandemic, are indoor exposures. Indoor exposures to viruses, um, whether it's contact, air, indoor exposure to bacteria, fungal organisms. But that's only one dimension. You know, Wells Riley had a lot to say about that with tuberculosis and measles. So, but what we're inhaling is only one part of how the indoor environment affects us. The other parts are how does, how does the building affect our body? How does it affect our immune system, our metabolism? How does it affect our microbiome? And if you're thinking, well, how those things are affected would be over a long period of time, that's actually not true. Our body begins to respond within about 10 minutes to characteristics of the air. So what else do we have to think about? We have to think about the impact of the indoor environment on our immune system. Um, we have to think about the impact on, of the indoor environment on the rest of our tissues. Even things like your, your, whether you're going to have a heart, whether you're more likely to have a heart attack or have more blood clotting issues, such as a stroke, heart attack, is very, very much dependent on our environment. Whether you're skinny or fat has, to, has something to do with the microbiome of the building, which has to do with our microbiome. Whether you're vulnerable to Alzheimer's disease or Parkinson's is related to the indoor environment. Does, is this a surprise to anyone? Yeah. Which part? The, are you still on the testicles, or are we back? <laughs> <laughs> environment, Alzheimer's. 
it's, it is absolutely remarkable. Um, I wish I had time to talk about the microbiome of our bodies. Are you familiar with microbiomes? So we, in 2003, when we finally, we, not me personally, finally sequenced the human genome, we found out humans only had about the same number of genes as a flowering plant. And so as a, us, human, us egocentric humans were like, that can't be possible. We're so complicated and fancy. And it ends up that the rest of what governs our health has to do with are the bacteria, viruses, and fungal organisms that live in and on us. And each of us is only 30% by cell number human. The rest of us is bacteria. And that's after you go to the bathroom. Before you go to the bathroom, you're even more bacteria. <laughs> so it's really phenomenal, I think. But anyway, so how the mix of microbes determines your vulnerability to a lot of diseases, including Parkinson's, Alzheimer's, uh, and pretty much everything. So we also have to think about the impact of the indoor air environment on building materials. So we, you're probably pretty used to thinking about off-gassing of VOCs and think, things like that, or the presence of mold and, and spores. And, and, but we have to consider how the indoor air influences the microbiome of the building, which then influences our microbiome. So how long do you think it takes for each of us to leave our microbial signature in a building? I mean, it probably is because things are on a continuum, but in a hospital, they say if somebody's been in a hospital room for 15 minutes, they're going to influence your clinical outcome through their microbiome. So it's, you know, if you're going to rob a house, do it really quickly so that the forensic microbiologist doesn't come in and, and identify your microbiome. Um, I like to tease Bill, because if a person has a dog or lives with dog versus cats, you have different characteristics. Like, I think dogs make friendly, healthy people. People with cats have anger management issues, but not <laughs> Bill. <laughs> but there's actually research around the presence of toxoplasmosis Gandhi antigen in your blood, which come from cats, and like road rage. So I have seven dogs, <laughs> but I love Bill. I've never seen him mad. So I, when I, what I want to talk with you now is a real-time indoor air quality diagnostic platform that integrates studies in toxicology, epidemiology, cell biology, and medicine so that we can actually monitor and visualize and manage buildings from the perspective of human health. So how do we do that? How, do, how have I been doing that in the last several years? One, measure. So monitor. Monitor your indoor spaces. Um, and you can do that, you know, with a lot of sensors or a few sensors, depending on your goals and budget. So we have uh, indoor sensors that measure 11 different components. We also measure the outdoor environment, like directly at your building site because publicly available monitors for outdoor air quality might be, might not really reflect what's going on around your building. So we continually monitor these things that I'll tell you about. We run them through an algorithm in, in the cloud. <clears throat> we report back to you. And you can either get a very simple score between 1 and 100, 100 being great, 0 being not at all great. And then you can, we recommend remediation steps based on the quality of the outdoor air, what's going on indoors, um, and how those two interface. So what's the first thing? Identify the indoor air components that affect your health, both individually and in combination. And the in combination is really important to think about because, for example, if you have particulate matter in the air, you run the risk of inhaling it. And you probably will because you're inhaling a lot of air. If the relative humidity in your space is very low, those particles are generally going to be smaller and you're going to inhale them more deeply into your lungs. Not only because they're smaller, but because the mucus that lines your respiratory tract is going to be dehydrated. Your cilia don't work as well. And so you, your exposure will be greater. Add ozone to that. Ozone causes inflammation of cells. So if you have particles, low humidity and ozone from electronic equipment or coming in from the troposphere, ozone 
pulls cells apart and makes the cell membranes more permeable. So then you're at kind of a triple risk. So we look at not only the individual metrics, but how they interact um, when it comes to your health. So the first step is to identify the indoor components. I don't want to call them pollutants because it includes temperature and humidity. And, and begin to quantify how those impact your body. Now that's a big topic. Um, the EPA doesn't like to think about how these things interact to affect your health, but we've really done a deep dive. I'd be more than happy to share those, uh, the, the, the data with you, but I don't have time to do it right this second. But I have it in this presentation if you'd like to explore more deeply. So identify thermometrics, particles, and gases that are essential to your health. And this, this slide is probably the most important. So those are the 11 things we monitor, humidity, temperature, particulate matter in three different sizes, TVOCs, which are a total pain in the neck because they can be good, bad, or indifferent, um, ozone, carbon monoxide, carbon dioxide, and then carbon, carbon combustion byproducts, so NO2 and SO2. So we take all of those metrics, measure continuously, and like I said, look at not only the individual components, but the, how they impact your body uh, interactively. We quantify, again, I, we can talk about this for a long time if you want, the impact on these different systems, and then we give you a score. But when you're thinking about the score and what you're gonna do about it if it happens to be suboptimal, you know, and you're, so, Obviously, ventilation is a key strategy, but before you ventilate, and Bill touched on this yesterday, what do you do if there are uh, pollutants from wildfires around? You know, when do you seal up your building or recirculate? Um, when do you bring in outdoor air and how much? And so we're able to, by using this algorithm and these, uh, this approach, you're able to actually say, is it, it, are the conditions worse outside for your health? or are they worse inside, and what should you do? I'm kind of going through this quickly because um, I don't have too, too much time. And then we, and then we report back to you. Um, and whoever you think is appropriate to see the information gets the information, whether it's a building owner, manager, tenant, or whomever. So how, so, okay, so let's just take a look at one case study. Um, but this is generally our approach. You, we monitor different buildings, different rooms within the building, um, and then when it comes to reporting back to the customer, you know, you can see the, the monitor yourself, but we also like to uh, give reports periodically. So we kind of do a deep, you know, we start broad, and then we do a deeper dive into where the sensors are. If you get, am I going too fast? None of this is rocket science, really. I just want to show you the, the organization of our approach. So this is, this is a, uh, this study, or this, how am I doing, oh yikes. So this is a senior living community in Plymouth, uh, Minnesota, and I've removed the name just for confidentiality. Um, it's, an elderly, it's an elderly care community that has skilled nursing, um, independent, everything from skilled nursing to independent living. And the, it's kind of a, one of our pilots, so they only have five indoor sensors and one outdoor sensor. So this is what you get um, in your report. So this shows, these lines show the health score, the vital signs score. And there are four lines because we break the score into temperature metrics, particulate matter, and gases. But remember, we're not only looking at each of those alone. We look at how they interact with each other. Because our customers say, well, why don't you put like thresholds? Why don't you have like green, yellow, red, like EPA does to show if things are bad? We can't do it with, with our score, be, again, because we're looking at interactions. But, but just to give you an idea of what this community saw um, over a two-week period of monitoring, and remember, down is bad. Down is like you're, you're failing, like, because we're all kind of acting in the academics. So if you're less than 50, you're gonna to have to do something. So you can see that around June 28th, something was going on in these buildings. This is an average score for the indoor sensors. And yesterday, somebody said, I think it was yesterday, maybe Monday, you know, when you average things out, everything's useless. 
which I thought was really apropos, <laughs> and I totally agree. But still, you might want to say, well, what's happening across my entire building or portfolio? So this kind of gives you an idea that something was going on uh, end of June and then again on July 4th. So, so now let's take a look at individual sensors, although we're going to have to do it quickly. So these are like each of these graphs represents a different sensor in a different room. So you see a conference room, you see a dining room. Um, over here we have a dining room on the third floor and then uh, an office with a lot of IT equipment. If, in case you're wondering why there are all these lines, why there are four, um, again, it's so that you can begin to see which components are, are driving a low score. But if we go back to, um, if we go back to say, the Maple Conference Room on the second floor, you see some dips, so some, there's something going on. But it looks different from the third floor dining room and it looks different from the office. So, you know, why is that? So to begin to drill down on that, um, first of all, we ask, well, are these things coming from the outdoor environment? Because if they were, you'd expect to see some sort of patterns that generally reflects the outdoor environment, especially if you're, you're uh, ventilating um, significantly. So we take a look at the outdoor score, but then it's time to dive more deeply into the data. And this is not something that you would see on your dashboard, but we, it's something that you can derive from your dashboard. So here, um, I was saying, OK, well, here we have uh, particles driving a low score. So where are they coming from? Are they coming from indoors or outdoors? Because obviously, if they're coming from indoors or outdoors, you're going to have a different remediation strategy. So in this case, with particles, you see they're mostly coming from outdoors. And this is about the time when there were the wildfires were upwind and um, there was particulate matter drifting down into Minnesota. So you can go through each of these different components and say, OK, if it's causing a problem, where is it coming from? And where is it localized? What part of your building? So this is looking at carbon dioxide, the, the blue, sort of medium blue. Uh, Let's see. What did I say? Oh, yeah. So you, the green are the outdoor levels. And they're generally what you would kind of expect, um, you know, between 400 and whatever that is. It's what you would expect. <laughs> and you, but some in the, in the uh, Maple Conference room, you see the levels are higher. They're not terrible. Joe Allen might not like that. Um, he'd say that you're getting sleepy. Your body really can tolerate uh, those levels pretty, pretty easily. But, but what I want to show you is how you can begin to see the origin of some of these indoor components. How about carbon monoxide? You can see that they're, for a non-vulnerable population, which is not what you have in a senior living community, the levels are generally OK. Um, but again, you can begin to identify sources and therefore remediation. Ozone. So something was going on in this office, and we, we found out that not only was the, the guy in the office, he was doing all sorts of experiments with electronic equipment, um, but he also had some direct intake from uh, out, outdoor areas where the ozone was periodically high. Who, TVOCs are tricky. Who's ever tried to monitor TVOCs? Yeah, it could be your hand sanitizer. It could be benzene. It could be toluene. It could be perfume. It could be red wine from Joe's cellar. You know, they all, kind of they all kind of show up in the same way. But the really cool thing about TVOCs, the ones that tend to be harmful to our health um, form aerosols. And they also have, uh, they're more reactive. So by looking holistically at these metrics, even though TVOCs by themselves are a mystery for largely, if you look at the after products, if you look at ozone and particulate matter generation, you can begin to differentiate bad TVOCs from, from benign ones, which I think is another really phenomenally interesting thing. So for this building, you know, this is just sort of an example of our conclusions for them. This was after like a two-week period. You know, in general, the health scores were acceptable for a non vulnerable population, senior living communities have vulnerable people in them. So I think that there was 
uh, remediation needed. But by talking about vulnerable and non-vulnerable populations, you can really begin to get at some of this um, environmental, these environmental justice questions. For example, young uh, African-American males struggle more with sickle cell anemia and sickle cell crises. They're also more sensitive to, to triggering a sickle cell crisis by particle levels. So you can, if you have a vulnerable population, you could set your, your level, your threshold for acceptable differently. If you're in a burn unit or a pediatric, um, <clears throat> you know, place like the Ronald, Ronald McDonald House where, pediat where kids and families stay when they're recovering from cancer or they're on chemotherapy. But you can modify your acceptable threshold. <clears throat> So we found in this study that the office had the highest CO2 and ozone. Um, first room floors were having more problems in higher levels. Again, I don't want to spend a lot of time with this because number one, it would take too long. Number two, you can probably sort of think for yourselves how the spaces might vary. Okay, so who thinks that you can just say, well, this is the right thing to do. This is morally the right thing to do. So everyone's gonna do it. <laughs> It's kind of like selling religion, at least in my experience. People go, yes, we should do that, and then they leave and nothing changes. So you have to show the business model. And it's kind of challenging, in my experience, when it comes to human health. Different buildings with different types of occupants, so different things going on have different return on investment. Senior living communities are actually fairly, a little bit more straightforward than other buildings because by showing a correlation between indoor air quality and things like patients having or residents having to go back to an acute care hospital because they've got a COVID or the flu, the, the senior living community would then have an empty bed that they have to hold for that patient for some period of time. And the reimbursement rate for an empty bed is about 10%, the reimbursement rate for an occupied bed. So different buildings have are more or less difficult to gather return on investment data. But it's a very important exercise because otherwise your building owner or manager or business isn't gonna to wanna to spend money on monitoring and understanding health. At least that's been my experience. Um, so we've been able to show you can reduce staff fatigue. These are metrics in the literature and we're beginning to see them in our, our studies. Optimize resident health and reduce bounce backs to acute care hospitals, save energy costs by doing the most appropriate uh, building. I, I call it remediation. It's not always remediation, it's management. But you know when there's uh, byproducts of a forest, of a wildfire in the air. Even if it's not a visible particulate, um, in this community, the ozone level went quite high after these fires, and so they canceled the outdoor activities, and the residents were like, but why? The air looks pretty good. But they were able to show why it wasn't a good idea to be outdoors that day. And again, this, I don't want you to read this, although you're welcome to, but hospitals would be, in my opinion, one of the most obvious places to implement this sort of monitoring. Has anyone ever tried to get infection data from a hospital or data on errors? Well, I did early on because a very um, nice, impulsive, trusting microbiologist sent me about 400 patient records. He then lost his job. Um, but I had the data and it was uh, a gold mine. <laughs> but hospitals are really hard places to get data because they don't really want to share their baseline errors or infections. Joe, did you put up your hands yet? I did. Oh, I didn't see you. <laughs> Okay, so what, do, what, are, what are my next steps? What do I hope your next steps are if you think this is important? You know, we need to scale this approach of monitoring and managing buildings from the perspective of health. And to do that, we have to continue to gather return on investment data. Energy is more straightforward because you're, you have to pay for it directly. You know, I say number three, ask the lawyers to go away because once you start talking about health or dosage or exposure in buildings, you know, you're, the fear is that if the data is known, that you're gonna, you could possibly be 
it could be subpoenaed and you'd be sued. And it's, I think it's a, a big inhibition in, in understanding the impact of the indoor environment on health. So anyway, thank you. I have a bunch more slides on the foundation of these metrics, and I'd love to talk with you about it if you want. We have time for one question. Uh, I love the presentation. I'm curious in your aspect, and I think I know the answer, but I'm going to ask from you. You're focused on, multi on senior living communities, hospitals, this and that. I think a larger research and focus needs to go into residential housing or multifamily housing to see the impact of ROI on the health society from that view. I have a feeling our impact on how we're building tighter and not man we built tighter for a long time without managing error and living in multifamily with closer proximity and lower air handling has actually had a bigger impact on overall health than by the time it gets to that point. You're right. And these are just a couple things I showed you. One of our real visionary um, groups is actually at this conference, and that's RDH up in Canada. So RDH has been very um, proactive in, and actually thanks to last year's building summer camp, Graham Finch and Coach. I agree with you. Um, I think any occupied building should be monitored from this perspective, to tell you the truth. All right, well, once again, Wow, wow, wow. <laughs> Thank you. And that's not it. <laughs> that, that, that was a happy dog barking. <laughs> All right, thank you very much. Bye.